get real advice from renowned experts and entrepreneurs on today's business leaders. Here's your host, Gabe Arnold. All right, on today's show, I have George Bryant. He is the uh, he is an entrepreneur. Uh, he is a New York Times bestselling author, and he created something called Relationship Speed Algorithms, and that is why he is on the show today. Um, and we're going to dive into that. Uh, but welcome to the show, George. I'm really happy to have you here. Oh, thanks for having me, man. I got a fresh cup of coffee that's nice and cold that I haven't drank all morning, and I'm ready to go. <laughs> awesome. So, tell me about when you first realized that you were an entrepreneur. Yeah. Yeah. So probably when I was like nine and I lied about my age and I had three paper routes so I could make money and buy that bike I wanted was probably like the first time, but it took me until I was about 30 to recognize that I was an entrepreneur as a kid. Um, you know, and, and I grew up in a pretty tumultuous childhood. So like drug abuse, physical abuse, sexual abuse, but my dad was always like a really hard worker, even in the midst of his struggles. And he was also his general contractor owned his own business. I wouldn't call it successful. I would call it a liability, right? And so I didn't have this model, but I, I just remember at this very young age because of my childhood, it was like I lived in a world that if I wanted something, I had to provide it for myself. And so I literally will never forget. It was the Sun Chronicle newspaper. And back in the day, they would drop advertisements in your mailbox looking for paper boys, looking for paper routes. And I knew another kid that had one. And they were like, yeah, all you need is a bike and boom, boom, boom. And so most kids got one route and they, I think they said you had to be like 12 or something. I think I was nine or 10. And I was like, I want to do it. And then I signed up for three of them. And so every morning before school, I would take my bicycle and I would go ride probably, it was probably around seven miles and I would have around 160 houses to hit. And that would be before I went to school. But that was when I was like nine or 10. And I had that paper. Route. I've never talked about this ever. This is the first time um, I had that paper out. And one of my favorite things to do was ice skating, right? Like I played street hockey with my friends. I never played on the sports team, but I was like ice skating. And I was at the ice skating rink and I got yelled at for going too fast, right? That happened all the time. And the kid that yelled at me, I was like, do you get paid to skate around and yell at people? He's like, yeah, we can go as fast as we want. But like they paid like 12 bucks an hour back then, 10 bucks an hour is all under the table. I was like, how old do you have to be? He's like 13. And so I was like 12. And so I walked in, I was like, I want a job. And then they're like, how old are you? I'm like 13. They didn't ask for working papers. They didn't ask for anything. And so then I had a paper route and a skate guard. And I was like the dream life. And then that was just kind of where it started. And so that's when I... I like started, I had it in me, but I didn't realize it until I was an adult because then I spent 12 years in the Marine Corps and my goal was to do 30 years and then hand out smiley face stickers at Walmart. Like that was my vision. That's where I was going. And when they decided that they were going to medically separate me because I got, you know, injured one too many times, um, I didn't really know what to do, but I had started this journey of health of like getting my health back and beating my bulimia and, eating paleo and doing CrossFit and teaching myself how to cook. And so I was lucky enough that when I was doing that, I was like, I need accountability. So I'll document it on Facebook. This was like 2010. And back then I didn't go to college. So I had to make a fake college account to get a Facebook account to then have a page so I could post recipes of I was making every day to hold myself accountable. And sure enough, um, when the Marine Corps is like, Hey, we're done with you. That consistency for six months turned into a blog, which turned into an ebook, which turned into an app, turned into a book. And then the rest is history. And so then once I found that kind of forced container, right? Parkinson's law, like you'll fill whatever one you get. I was like, well, I don't know what to do. I don't really have a good skill set. I'm not going to go work in it with my skill set, And I'm not going to go pull a trigger and be a general contractor, you know, overseas. And I'm like, what am I going to do? I'm like, I guess I'll be a food blogger. And then it was in that that I started to realize that I'd already kind of like had this hunger or this drive in me to always kind of be disruptive and do things differently and, and find my own path. And so that's kind of the full circle how I got there. That's awesome, man. I've never talked about that paper boy, paper route thing ever, actually. Yeah, I remember being about that age, too, and trying to figure out how to make money because when you're making that kind of money as a kid, you can have anything you want. Dude, I was balling. I was balling. My favorite movie was Rad, the BMX movie. 
And my first purchase is I bought the blue bike from that movie with my own money. It was like $460 back then. This was like 19, 1992, yeah. 1992, 1993. Like I was balling. I was like 10, 11 years old with like $700, man. I was like a millionaire. <laughs> Yeah, I remember when I sold my first website at 16 for 3000 bucks, and I was like, holy shit. Woo! Yeah, this man. Amazing. <laughs> and if all we did back then was buy Bitcoin, we'd be in a different spot right now. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> <laughs> and you said something really interesting that just kind of hit me differently. I've heard, I've heard similar statements, but you said when you grew up, you realized that if you, if you wanted something, you were going to have to get it yourself. Yeah. And I, I can relate to that because... Uh, we grew up relatively similarly. It sounds like as far yeah. as family life and stuff like that. I don't, I don't, I'm grateful. I don't think I went through the level of trauma you did, but um, growing up broke in a huge family, like real broke sucks. And you quickly realize, well, clearly they're not paying the bills or providing. So I'm going to have to do something for myself. And for me, it was for me and my siblings. So I think that, um, I think that skews you, and ske- skewed me with a really interesting mindset early on that I'm very grateful for now, but it was really a challenge for a long time. So, well, you know, you know, it's funny as about people like us or anybody, and, and, and it doesn't even have to be a rough childhood. It's just the paradigm developed based on, you know, socioeconomics, your paradigm, your school, your church, your religion, right. You, know, you could be, have a silver spoon in your mouth and feel the same way because of how you were treated. But here's the funny thing is like, we got the lesson young and now I watch people pay six and seven figures for coaching to learn that lesson, to become self-sovereign and self-reliant. And so it's really interesting when you, when you take that perspective, because there's people that are like, Oh my God, like everything's been done for me. Like, how do I do this? Like, how do I claim my self-sovereignty? Like, how do I go after this myself? And it's just, it's a really interesting perspective to see how we all kind of end up in the same place, regardless of where we come from. But yeah, it is, um, it's definitely looking back. It's definitely a skill set, And it's one that was then further sharpened in the Marine Corps. Right. Cause I, just like you, like that doesn't go away. Like I didn't turn 13 and it got easier. I didn't turn 15 and it got easier. I turned 17, forged my parents signature and got the hell out of there and joined the Marine Corps. And, you know, probably not the smartest move. Like I should have joined the air force, the coast guard, but, and, and that's credit to them. Um, But then what happened in is the Marine Corps was the same kind of paradigm. It was like, there's only 175,000 Marines to like the 2 million people in the army. And we have one where they have 10 and then we have their leftover gear from 20 years ago. And they're like, make it work and win wars. And you're the first one. And so it was this kind of like always scrappy, hungry, I can figure it out mentality. And I got 12 years of my life in that on top of my childhood. So you know, I'd say the hardest part was when I transitioned from Marine to entrepreneur is um, normal human beings don't operate like that. And I was a bulldozer because I was like, why, why? And they're like, Hey, this isn't the military. Like you can't walk into the bank and demand what you want to do. And they have to listen to you. Right. And so a lot of my, a lot of my work (laughs) and healing has been finding a, a really healthy, relationship with that and restraint and awareness around that it is a gift and it is a skill set but if you're a hundred percent warrior all the time it's not good if you're a hundred percent king or savage you know if you do men's work you know king warrior poet magician it's always figuring out what level of harmony you need between those areas and the practice of it but i I will say it was it was a pretty good gift and and it's worked well in my career as an entrepreneur yeah yeah, that's a good description of it. And that's definitely something I'm learning too, where it sounds like we're almost exactly the same age. And it's like my teens and twenties were fucking tumultuous. Like, and for many reasons, but I'm highly aware at this point that I caused a lot of that chaos. And it's like, it's because, you know, the old saying, like to the person that only owns a hammer, everything's a nail. Yeah. And then, as an entrepreneur, it's like, I, I don't understand why you can't get that done for me in the next two hours of any day. Cause I could, and it's like, that's how yes. I feel. And, and it's also true most of the time too, but I really had to, I really had to step back and learn about how normal people for lack of a better term, normal people, not entrepreneurs operate so that I can really show up for them and serve them in the relationship and things like that. And even people that 
like things I'm learning with my with my team right now and just in leadership and trying to grow and develop as a as an entrepreneur and leader is like even people that aspire to be where you are and try to keep up with you in the way you operate and think as an entrepreneur, you have to you have to think you have to think it through and effectively evaluate where they really are to serve them instead of where they say they are. And that's a yeah. huge lesson for me this year. And it's like um, but it is like our number one guiding principle at, um, you know, at business marketing and is that relationships mattered more than money to us always. Yeah. Yeah. And that took me, honestly, I didn't understand that until probably three years ago. But once I made that shift, man, everything is a lot easier in the sense of like outcomes and results and ongoing sustainability and growth is so much easier. There's obviously hard moments with that. You have to confront hard stuff and you have to do things that are uncomfortable, but um, that's why, you know, we were chatting before we jumped on the recording here about how we reconnected and reconnected a few times on Facebook and things like that. But when Alex Sharfin posted something about, you know, check out George's group relationships beat algorithms, I was like, man, that's, that's where I'm at. I'm in. And I, I think that that statement alone is worth paying attention to. For so. sure. Yeah. And, and one thing I, cause you know, we're marketers. So the Zygarnik effect drives me nuts. And so there's a brain, open loop in my brain based on something you said. So I have to close it real quick. Yeah. The one, the one thing, the, the important thread of understanding what you just said in relationships, beating algorithms is that the, the numero uno priority is the relationship with self. The, the secret to success as an entrepreneur is a high level of self-awareness, self-integrity and self-exploration. And yeah. It informs everything that we do, whether you lead a team of one or a team of 20, whether you're on a team, it's like that self-sovereignty. And so, you know, a lot of people hear when I say that and they're like, oh, it's a marketing thing. I'm like, it's so much deeper. There's levels and levels and levels to it. But one of those things that we have to understand is that relationship to self is understanding what our, what our, our defaults are, right? Like you and I thrive in chaos, right? And so what'll happen, and I'm, I'm going out on a limb here, but I'm, I'm going to suspect that I'm pretty close to accurate that if everything's going smoothly and operationally, we either make it chaotic or we think it's about to get chaotic and we derail it and we create a self-fulfilling prophecy. And so what will happen is we find our value and meaning and like throw us a mess. We'll clean it up. We'll show you it works and we'll prove it can be done. But then once it gets into the operational, of like the race car is perfect, just let it drive. We're like, no, something's going to break or we're going to break it because we got to test this. Like we got to figure this out. And so what is so amazing about that as well, though, is that it sets us up to win massively as entrepreneurs when an ad account gets shut down or when a new platform launches or this stops working or that stops working. But then we have to be aware of it for when things are coasting and things are doing like they're supposed to, that we don't come break it and push that down on our team or in the people that matter and create a self-sabotaging, you know, self-fulfilling prophecy. And so that awareness is key, right? Those containers and understanding. And so I used to think like it was bad, right? And it's like, no, but it can show up everywhere in your personal relationships, with your kids, with your employees, with your business, with everything. And the moment you become aware of it, you just have to ask yourself in that moment, like, is this the time for me to be scrappy? Is this the time for me to like drop an atomic bomb on what's working so well? Or do I need to containerize that a little bit differently? And so I had to, I had to say that because I think for me, and like you're smiling about it and, and that's good because I think for years I made it wrong, right? Because it was a bad thing because I wasn't aware of it. And so I would come and people would have resistance to me. My team wouldn't feel safe. But then the moment you can acknowledge it, they're like, they can joke about it with you. And they're like, and then there's times where like, hey, we need that scrappiness right now. Like we need you to get in, you know, things are boom, 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 boom. And so it's just always kind of practicing that. So, you know, when we pull this thread into the relationship side, you know, the one thing that I always, I always tend to go back to is that, that relationship with self is, you know, one of the things, and, and I'll pull the thread because I know you're going to ask me in a minute, but you know, somebody asked me a long time ago, uh, it was at a keynote, I think it was at Ryan Moran's Capitalism or Brand Builder Summit, and I was keynoting. And, you know, the thing that people come up to us all the time is like, I have a marketing problem, right? I have a conversion problem. I have a, whoa. And, and I look them all in the dead in the eye. I'm like, none of you have a marketing problem. Everyone goes a relationship problem. And you have a relationship problem with yourself, your team, and your customers informed in that order. And it's like a big break check for people, right? But what we forget is that we inform everything that we touch. We inform our team's excitement 
and pride and momentum into that project. We inform how our team interacts with our customers. And then that gets passed down into what gets written in our social posts and what goes in our email and how our customers feel and relate to the brand. And so you can look and you can tell companies that have asshole CEOs and you can feel it across the board. And then you can look at companies that have a good culture because the CEO is self-aware and open and somehow magically all their marketing works regardless of what copy they write or how many times a day they post on Instagram. And so I say this because a lot of entrepreneurs challenge me because they're like, oh, that's so esoteric and it's so woo. -woo. I was like, okay, cool. When was the last time you walked into a restaurant as like an asshole and they were excited to serve you? And when was the last time that, they didn't have a table, but you were over genuinely nice and connected and patient. And then they went out of their way to support you. I was like, it's no different in your business and in your marketing. Like the internet doesn't give you a permission slip to be a dick, right? Like you have to work on yourself and you have to be aware because we really are consistently in everything that we touch. We're translating energy. Like you're a copywriter, you know this, right? Like people are like, oh, it's the words. I'm like, it's not the words. It's the feeling that went into the words. Exactly. I was like, the words are literally a Trojan horse to a feeling for their soul. Yeah. And I was like, and if you write that email from a place of like, oh, or they're going to buy, or uh, I'm like, it never works. But the moment you write it from a place of like, this is how I want them to feel. And this is how I could progress them. The words don't matter so much and the results still come. And so I, I just got to say that because people take it wrong all the time. They're like, oh, I was like, listen, sales is a transference of energy, right? Results are a transference of energy. A conversion is somebody identifying where they are and where they want to go and them feeling safe enough to make that decision. And I can't name one time in my life where I'm like, God, they treated me like shit. They were an asshole to me. Let me give them five grand. Exactly. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I don't know. That's that's my little soapbox rant. I'll show up. No, I love it because you're right. And I'm, I'm laughing because uh, I've you know, burned my life to the ground like three or four times in my 20s because I didn't know how to put down a container. I didn't know what was happening until I met my partner, Rachel, like, and she hey, me too. Yeah. She's like, she's like, you implode your life a lot, don't you? <laughs> yeah. Everyone's like, George, how are you so successful? I was like, my wife. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I'm like, my, my wife's job is to put containers around me so I can only smash a little bit. And no matter what, I end up going in the right direction. Exactly. <laughs> It's like that, uh, the stall and the, you know, the racetrack where you got to put them in because they're dancing around so much yep. they, then they can go. Yeah. So, we're yeah. like racehorses, right? Like you gotta, you gotta contain us and put us in the right direction. But when we do, it's game on. Yeah. And that's being aware of that. And I, and I'm not, I'm not surprised when you said it, but I'm glad you said it of like, well, the first relationship is for yourself. And yeah. that is the only reason my organization has been able to grow is because I've slowed down and gone like, what the fuck is the matter with me? Or what am I doing wrong? Or, or what, you know, structure and process and healthy constraints am I missing? Which is now a more, actually a more accurate way of saying what I, what I realized. And then when we put that stuff in place, I'm like, cool, like I'm cruising. And, and and I love what you said too, that we're either going to implode something because we're bored is the way I, I always looked at it as I was bored. That was, that, that was my biggest trigger. So I really protect against boredom now. Yep. Um, or like something doesn't go the way I think it should go. And I just rip everything out. And I, I really wasn't conscious of the change impact and the change cost. And, and I truly wasn't aware of the relationship capital cost. Totally. That, when that hit me, I was like, oh my God, I have to change. And oh yeah, you can you can you can set a relationship back five years with one decision and one of those things. And yeah, I, I'll pull this like esoteric self-awareness thread a bit since you 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 primed it and I think it's really, really important. Yeah. You know, one of the things that I think is so powerful is like when you ask an entrepreneur, like, why do you do what you do? Like, why do you want to make a million dollars? They all give you the same three reasons, right? Time, money, and freedom, right? Yeah. But the moment I give that to them, they can't stand it and they go create more work. Exactly. Right? And it's this illusion, like this delusion, because as, as entrepreneurs, and I'm only, listen, if this lands, take it. If it doesn't, don't. But like I'm speaking about myself and I know Gabe's going to nod. Yeah. Um, when we think about it is we find our value and our ability to work hard, not in the results that come, right? We find our value in always having something to do 
because it distracts us from being in a relationship with the person that we get to spend the rest of our life with, whether we like it or not. Right. And so boredom for us is a representation of a self relationship because we have to sit with those feelings, but you and I will get anxiety and we know the moment we get it, we can get rid of it like a drug by putting it into work as an entrepreneur. (laughs) And so that's what we do. And then what we do is we then attach our meaning to the results of that work and then we never allow it to be enough. And so then we use that feedback as fuel to do it again and again and again. And then we're tired, exhausted, no results come. And everyone's like, what are you doing? And it's this like cyclical washing machine over and over. Yeah. And here's what I've learned. It's just a muscle. It's really, really just a muscle and it's just practice, right? Because newsflash as an entrepreneur, your to-do list never ends, right? Like right now, like you and I both, if we compared parking lots, we both probably have 1500 items that we want to get done. And we're like, we can do them all at once and blah, blah, blah. And everyone's like, yeah, get away from me, (laughs) get away from me. Right. And so, you know, one, that one of the things that I I say a lot is like, just to be aware of it. Cause for me, what I was asking myself is like, what was I afraid of? Like, what was I afraid to feel? And, and a lot of it was I was actually setting myself up to fail because I never allowed myself the time to reflect, to look at the inputs and to give meaning to them and find my value in anything other than my ability to work hard. And my wife's like, she's sitting across the room right now. She's like, you always make things difficult and, and not always, but there was this part of me that like I had to go through this process and I still do it to this day. I'm a lot better at recognizing it now, but it's really making sure that we have that time, right? Like when we have this expansion time, you also have to have the contraction time and the space to reflect. And, you know, you have to have tight containers of like, Hey, if I'm bored or I feel like I can't do one of those things or I want to do one of those things that you never act in that place, that you put a bucket around it. And you're like, I can only act when I'm through it, when I'm aware of it, that I meditate or I went on a walk or I did breath work or I just sat in stillness for 10 minutes. So you never continue to feed that machine and then you pattern interrupt it because it's never ending. Like it's absolutely never ending, but our job is to be really intelligent with our time and to focus on our needle movers or as Mike McAllitz calls our queen bee role. But in order for that to happen, you got to let some time marinate to figure out what that strength is, right? Like I was like, no Olympic athlete runs a, a gold medal race every day. No, you know, professional football player plays in full sport, full contact every single day. But we as entrepreneurs, we're like, where is a badge of honor? Like we're going to get smacked around every day and somehow it's going to work. And it's like, yeah, no, that's not how this game goes. No. And it's really, yeah, it's really important to start to realize that stuff because in realizing that I like to jump in and solve problems. And that's, I love that. Um, I, my intention for this year, and this is something I'm working on, but this is my main focus for this year is to be really observational and thoughtful before I jump into something, because then I can be more effective in gathering all the data. And I can think through the situation. I can think about the relationship impact, impact, the, the cash impact, all these different things. And I really like what the theme has been here of like, you can do that stuff. You can do your thing and be you and live in your genius zone and get all fired up and have fun. If uh, you can do it regardless, but it's wisest to do it in, within those containers of structure. So yep. like I, I really enjoy just like ripping things down and building them up again. So I actually have in my calendar every week, I choose something that will be beneficial that I should rip down and build up again mm. or should do a big re-engineering on. And I'll give myself, you know, a a night a week where I'll sit down and I'll work until the sun comes up because that's how I, I feel alive. Yeah. You got to get your drug. You got to get your drug. Exactly. And it's okay to be that way, but it's not okay to do that every night and then be irrational and reactionary to everybody in my life because then I won't have anybody in my life. So. Exactly. And, and one of the big <laughs> concepts that you're talking about is like you understand yourself, but you put a container around it, right? So you get your need. And also because it's containerized, you actually end up moving the needle forward, right? Because you have the ingredients required to make the decision. Right. And yeah. I think that's one of the biggest ones. Like we in the company have like a parking lot. And so like I have a 48 hour baking period. So like if there's something like I want to do it right now, I have to put it in Slack in the parking lot and I can't look at it again for two days. (laughs) And so what it does is it forces this like 
container of like non-reactivity because what ends up happening is like oh the board's loose let me re-nail it in but when you re-nail it in you miss the fact that the foundation's crumbling because you didn't look at it long enough to make sure that you weren't just treating a symptom but you were getting to the root cause and and we have to spend time like you were saying exploring what all the options are because like you would never build a house without a blueprint right like you would never start cooking a recipe without all the ingredients and expect a result to come out of the end of it So as an entrepreneur, we have to do the same thing. Like we have to make sure that we have a full awareness of the current state of what's coming up, that we can collect what's there at our disposal and then have the intention and the plan to try something or mitigate something. So we have a measure, so we have a container. And so we have the ability to adjust as needed. So yeah, I I love that. Yeah. And that's, so yeah, it it all does come down to really knowing yourself. And for me, I've, constantly worked on that with different levels of effectiveness but then when i met rachel like that was a huge thing she was an incredible and is an incredible mirror to me and also um calls me out on my bullshit but also creates the protective spaces and things that i need and removes noise and like it's i always tell everybody like if you want to be successful in business you need a rachel and like same thing for you like with your wife it's like you if you don't have that it's going to be tough. Like it's possible, but it's going to be really, really tough. Um, so yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, we could do an entire episode on my rant on the quote unquote solopreneur. Oh yeah. man. That one. I was like, yeah, you're full of shit. Exactly. I was like solopreneur. I was like, there's a hundred people around me that are the only reason I'm successful. Exactly. I always tell everybody when I hire them, your job is to manage me. <laughs> yeah, dude, dude I, I'm, the same, I'm the same way. It doesn't matter what position you're in. You're good luck because you're one of the, you know, now like, six managers of my life. <laughs> one of my favorite things is like when my team, like I literally like my heart dances when they tell me no, or they tell me to go away, or they tell me to get in my lane or like, hey, you said, I was like, okay, uh, yes, yes, sir. Yep. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Got it. <laughs> Got it. Thank you. Yeah. So, yeah. So, we've talked about it a little bit here but let's dive in like relationship beat out beats algorithms um like i said that was like i'm like i want to talk to him more and like you know i've we've been hanging around on facebook together and this is our first face-to-face conversation yeah um, yeah i love doing this so tell us more about that yeah so there's like levels to this game so i'm gonna i'm gonna share like the highest one and, and one of the ways that i say this is when it comes to business when it comes to marketing i think context makes up 90 percent of the results and content makes up the 10%, right? And same thing like with copywriting, right? The people like, go, I need a copywriter. I'm the copywriter. like, a copywriter without the right paradigm and without the right container is actually a liability. I was like, cause you can't go convince somebody in three emails to do something when you've ignored them for the last 60 days. Yeah. Right. And I was like, so what's more important than anything is the context, right? Like what's the journey you're gonna take people on? What value you're gonna add? And so, When I think about relationships beating algorithms, like at the end of the day, there's a human being on the other side of every single thing that we do. And the way that I look at it is that only one of two things is happening in every interaction with us. It is either moving them one step closer to us or pushing them one step further away from us. And that's it. And it's really, really that simple. And there's nothing wrong with that because there are people that should be pushed away because I'm not the right fit. They don't need me. They don't need my time and I don't need their attention when it's not going to help them in their life. And so only one of those two things is happening, right? And so that's high level, number one. It's either they're moving one step closer to my lighthouse or they're going back to sea because this is not the island that they're coming to, right? And so then when you get underneath that, then you have to understand, well, cool. Now, no matter what, every time somebody touches me, not every person is going to convert into something or opt into something or move into something. So it needs to be a touch point in a container, right? And it needs to be a touch point in a container that moves them forward, allows them to collect an evidential touch point, allows them to feel safe through the congruency and consistency of my messaging with a clear path for them to do what they want without me forcing them in, which is permission-based marketing, right? But I'll give you an example. Can you imagine if Nike's billboard said, just do it only if you pay me, (laughs) right? It wouldn't make sense. But yet in marketing and in business, a lot of the times everything's seen through this transactional lens for the 1% of your audience that will convert. Well, we ignore the other 99% that are one to 50 touch points away from converting, right? And so there's four customer journeys that there's only four customer journeys that exist that you have to solve for. People are going to see you and leave. They're going to see you and want to learn more. They're going to see you and want to opt in and they're going to want to see you and buy. 
And it's not your job to tell them what to do. It's your job to be consistent and build the Truman Show. So whenever they have enough touch points, they choose their own adventure, right? Yeah. And so one of the marketing laws I have is that everybody feels valuable whether they give you their credit card or not. Now, why would I say that? Hmm. Because if we grabbed 100 people that we told them about your copywriting service, and they are all like, I need copywriters, and I grabbed 100 of them, I guarantee you two to four of them would sign up right off the bat, right off the bat, because they're like, controllers, type A, give it to me, boom, right? But if all we did was talk about that, we left 96 other people that are potential customers out in the cold that would never happen, and then we move on to the next four while we burn 96 more bridges. Well, newsflash, 93% of marketing is word of mouth. And the average consumer gives eight to 10 brand recommendations or non-recommendations in a 60 second conversation. And there's only five reasons that people share humor, credibility, social status, education, and controversy. And so if you don't give them any of those, they'll go straight for the controversy. If you give them a positive experience, they'll share all the other ways building this machine that comes in. And so if you only solve for the 1%, you lose. But if you know that the rest of those people either got a touch point to move one step closer to either learning more in a piece of content, eventually opting or buying, and everything is in that container, then you have the ability to massively scale the business with or without their credit card because you're capitalizing on all the other leverage that comes through a relationship. And I can't name the last time I was like, God, that company, they disrespected me. They tried to convince me with seven upsells and I'm going to go tell all my friends to buy their product. (laughs) <laughs> or like, I'm so glad that I bought their product and they told me I was incomplete and I needed 64 more things to make it complete. And the product was a piece of shit. So, Hey, you should go buy it. Right? <laughs> but yep. I can tell you every time when a company is like, Hey, I know you think that you need us, but you really don't, but I would go do this instead and let me know how it goes. And I'm like, guys, you'll never believe it. I didn't even buy. And these people are helping me. They're sending me ideas. They're sending me gifts. And I can't stop by telling the world because it helps me fit into one of those buckets, humor, credibility, controversy, social status, or education. And so none of those are predicated on a transaction, but the transactions are a byproduct of deep rooted relationships. And so on the other side of everything that we do, there is no algorithm whipping out somebody's credit card. As much as you think there is, and you think that an algorithm is the thing that determines your success, An algorithm has nothing to do with your success because it's a human being making the decision. So it's not the algorithm's damn fault that your stuff doesn't convert. It's the context or the paradigm of the relationship, the inconsistency, the lack of depth, the incongruency across the board. And so when you can solve those things and you start looking at business, like how can I make sure that every person who touches this, that sees this either leaves the situation neutral or one step closer to their goal, whether they pay me or not. And that's where I started to look at this. So email, customer journey, social media, things like that. And like, I'll give a tangible example all the time. People like, how do I get more Instagram followers? Or how do I get more comments? And I'll open it up and like, oh, well, you have 30 comments per post. They're like, yeah, how do I get more? I was like, well, you haven't responded to any of these. And they're (laughs) like, well, yeah. And I was like, well, you can't feed these children. Why should you adopt any more? I was like, your path to getting more is responding to these ones. And they're like, uh, and I was like, yeah, exactly. And I was like, cause now you're conditioning these people that when they comment, you don't respond. Therefore they'll never comment again. Yeah. And I was like, so you have to look at this game and they're like, okay, but then what? I was like, okay, how many people liked it? They're like 420. And I'm like, cool. How many comments? They're like 30. I'm like, cool. Well, there's 390 people waiting for you to comment on their stuff first. Yeah. So you earn the right because just so you know, get off your fucking soapbox because you don't earn the right or have the right for somebody to comment just because you post content on Instagram. <laughs> Relationships are two way and your job is to initiate. And they're like, oh, and then they're like, then what? I'm like, then you're going to have to hire three people to maintain what's happening because you won't be able to control what happens. And then we can get into hashtags and we can get into everything else. I was like, yeah, but I would never let you adopt a child because you can't feed the ones that you have. They're screaming for your attention. They're screaming for your work. They're screaming for your help. And they're literally in your ecosystem saying, I like your content. I haven't cared enough to comment, but I have a credit card. And if you actually just initiate a relationship with me, I will pay you because it's not the best product that wins. It's the best relationship. Sure. So that would be the highest level summary I could give you of like why I created it and like why I trademarked it and what it means. And there's so much in it, like would take us 10 hours to unpack, but like, that's the gist of it at 30,000 feet. I love it, man. That was, that was 
super deep, even though it was a, a snippet. And yeah. I, you know what? I'm going to give another one because I always love giving examples. I'll give another one. I've talked about this one before, but here's here's the way that I look at it. If I have a hundred people that come into my door of a brick and mortar business, and I know let's say five of them are going to buy, that's great, right? But I have 95 marketing machines waiting in the wings to be my army as long as I help them feel seen, heard, or respected, regardless of if they buy. And the only difference between them marketing my product or talking shit about my product is how they feel when they leave in that interaction with me. Yeah. And so the way that I look at it is my job is to turn every no to neutral and every neutral to yes. And so I'll give you an example. Card abandonments. People use them all the time. None of us fucking forgot. Like, can we just stop insulting people's intelligence? You've <laughs> never forgot to buy something you wanted. That's right. <laughs> ever. You left because you had a doubt. You had buyer's remorse. You weren't sure. And yet we then say, hey, Gabe, you forgot something. Let me devalue my brand and give you a coupon code convincing you that you never should have paid full price in the first place. And now I'm just discounting across the board to convince you to come by, even though you're going to have more objections because you're not really ready, but I got a discount to get you in. And then I'm going to be pissed that your friends don't come in because you bought a program and didn't get results with because you weren't ready to start. And then I'm going to be like, oh, it's my customer's fault. <laughs> Basically. And I was yeah. like, so let's go the other way. And I did this with the collagen company, right? Somebody adds collagen to their car and they leave. There's a reason they left. And so my first email was, hey, I'm not going to insult your intelligence. Let's not pretend that you actually forgot something. Let's have an honest conversation how you got to the cart and I was missing something to help you complete your purchase. But there's a good chance you're interested in A, B, and C. And so instead of giving you a discount or trying to convince you this is the right fit, here's my 15-day guide to achieve the same results without my product just as a way to say thank you for your time since it's something I can never give back to you. Email two, subject line, I ethically bribed you. Hey, I want you to know that I sent you that because I bribed you, but I don't have to tell you why I bribed you until tomorrow because today I need you to get a result. And I'm gonna tell you right now, I know you're interested in A, B, and C. And so my product wasn't going to do this work for you. And so you need to do it now anyway. So I want you to go to page nine. I want you to make that recipe and I want you to have it today because it will help you achieve blank. And don't worry, tomorrow I will tell you why I bribed you. Email three, I really need your help. Hey, so now I've given you a gift. I feel like we're back to neutral and now I need you to give me a black eye. I want you to respond to this email and tell me why you didn't buy. And don't put the gloves on, take them off, like bare knuckle right to the nose. Like you didn't trust me. It was too expensive. It didn't meet your needs. You felt like it was a scam. I was like, I want you to have it. And I will respond to every single one of them. Oh boy. You should see the responses. Email four. I'm such an idiot. I can't believe I expected you to buy. And I didn't answer any of these questions. Question one, blah, blah, blah. Answer one. Question two, blah, blah, blah. Answer two. And listen, I don't care if you buy the product or not, but I would love to have you in the community. Keep doing this so we can support. Here's a link to our Facebook group. And at the bottom of every one of those emails, which is to link back to the cart, but I didn't mention it, didn't do whatever. We recovered 53% of cart abandons. Holy cow. By simply meeting them where they were and then helping them break through that objection and move forward regardless of the product. But can you imagine being like, okay, I want to lose weight. I want to buy the supplement. And you leave and I'm like, Gabe, you don't need my supplement. Screw it. Let me help you for free. And then before you ever pay me, you lose four pounds. How can you not ever buy my product? Yeah. Like I win. Like I just poach so much real estate in your brain that I'm the only person you can think about or use. And every other supplement that you see, every friend, you, whether you buy it or not, will be like, you have to buy it. Like I didn't even pay these people and I lost five pounds. Like, can you imagine what it's like? And yeah. I was like, but what it requires is empathy and patience. And in this game, the biggest mistake that people make is they live in a game of high end or low end prostitution. And they expect every single interaction to end by sealing the deal. And I was like, no, you have to court people. You have to date people. You have to communicate with people. And then if you have a bigger container or a longer period of burn, like a, a patience container, I guarantee you the results are always positive because nobody makes a decision in that moment. Yeah. So that's another one. I figured you'd appreciate that from a copywriting perspective. I love it, man. That's rock solid. And, and yeah, it's uh, 
yeah, you're exactly right. When businesses aren't scaling and when people aren't fulfilled and things aren't working, it's because they're not taking care of the, the children they have. And that's a great, that's a great way of looking at it. Man. Yeah. My uh, favorite one, my favorite one, like companies be like, I'm, I'm doing 10 million. I want to get to 20. Like, what do we do? And I was like, you do realize that growth is a retention game, not an acquisition game. Right. And they're like, yeah, I'm like, you can't adopt any more children to feed the ones that you have. And then literally like I was just with a company and I found about two and a half million dollars of revenue in the back end of the business, only on like a $5 million top line with fulfillment sequences and flows and getting people to use the product and not cancel subscriptions because they had three on the shelf because they weren't taught how to use it. Yeah. And I was like, you can go acquire a customer for $145 or I can take the LTV of 145 and make it 700 by actually being in a relationship with people. <laughs> yeah. No, that's, that's huge. And you're definitely right. And, and it's definitely the fastest way to, to win is slow down and focus on quality and get to know people and really figure out how to serve them. And that's that little, maybe massive paradigm shift that I, you know, started to experience three years ago and in the last couple of years really have dialed into and, you know, in the last year, like really focused on, we are slamming busy with no end in sight. And it's like, it's, and it's great. And we're working with people that we love and care about because we really are in relation with them. And, and that's, I always tell other entrepreneurs and other CEOs and stuff. Like I have two sets of clients. I have my internal clients, my team, and I have my external clients and both of them need to be treated amazingly well. And then when I do that, everything is super simple. And even my little freak outs or my little issues that I've mostly containerized i like how you say that are are pretty pretty harmless because the foundation is there and people truly know me and and i truly know them and man what a different way to operate instead of like you said being all transactional and i mean like and here's the thing i was like i was like i, I tell somebody i was like name me a hundred million dollar company where every customer felt like shit yeah <laughs> i was like listen it's like you can't say that you want to model these people but then you have toxic thinking that like, I'll only start modeling them when I get there. It's like, you only get there when you model them now, right? And there's no way to win a game where your business is predicated on people paying you money and you're not in relationships with the people that pay you money. And then you're upset that more people aren't paying you money because you're not in the relationships of the ones that do. Yeah. <laughs> and like, I just, my buddy Jim Quick was on the show the other day and I, like this one thing he said, like really stuck out with me. He's like, you cannot bitch about the results you don't have from the work that you didn't do yeah. <laughs> and it's so true and and actually one of the things you said that like i love the paradigm challenge and it's kind of like a mind-bending one is the fastest way to win is to slow down yeah like it's so good and my my, my buddy jeff spencer who's a, a champion coach he's responsible for 40 gold medals he's tiger woods coach lance armstrong's coach u2's coach and it's all mindset and he's like the reason olympians win is because they practice restraint he's yeah. like they don't go at a hundred every day. They go at 70% and they only turn the dial up when it's time to win the race. But all they're doing is being a consummate professional in what they do every single day. Yeah. And he's like, they go deep on themselves and they understand restraint and they slow down and they're meticulous and they measure and they reflect and they recover and then they do it again. And, and it's surrounded by us all the time. And as entrepreneurs, like I look at ourselves, like we are the tip of the iceberg when it comes to athleticism. Like we are, carved from a different cloth but yet the first thing we do is we sacrifice the race car that makes us successful which is our ability to maintain uncertainty and live in ambiguity but yet we sacrifice our sleep we don't eat right we don't take care of ourselves and then we basically burn our adrenals create this thing and it's like oh i wanted to do this and i sacrificed myself in the process you end up changing the world and dying in the process you never get to enjoy the fruits of your labor so i think it's such a, a valid valid point that i don't think is talked about enough in entrepreneurship i really really don't because like hustle culture is bullshit oh my god my opinion yeah I, like <laughs> we'll yeah. rant about that one over a bottle of wine because i'll go for like eight hours yeah i i just can't stand that absolutely shallow and completely futile mentality of you know hustle and grind and post 87,000 times a day and do all the 10x everything you're just 10x thing <laughs> you're 10x thing your way into the grave man so let's just clear about yeah, that be, be careful where you hit the fast forward button because you might not like the results exactly and yeah the the more i slow down the better things are and the easier it is and the faster i can go when i want to go fast 
Yeah. Um, and just like one other example, because I think this is this valuable conversation is only because I've really tried to put healthy constraints on myself in the last six and eight months. Uh, have I been able to do what I'm going to share here, but I've really stepped back and I, I observe and I evaluate and I see who's, you know, who's moving the needle in my company and what the right clients are and all these different things. And because of that, we're on this incredible growth path right now. Things are growing very aggressively in a managed way. I'm really grateful to say, but it's, it's, it's high strain and it's, it's good. And like the team's solid and we're solid, but I had a, I had a team member in a position where they were, um, they were doing first interviews and hiring and they were effective in that role for a short season, but then some you know conditions changed. And so I saw it and evaluated and thought about it for a couple of days and, you know, which I was really proud of myself because that's a really, really long time, as you know, George, to think about something for two days and not act on it. Um, and then I was like, you know what, I think I'm just going to make an adjustment. And I adjusted things. And in a matter of, you know, 48 hours, I hired seven excellent team members because I was able to give that burst of speed, just like you're talking about, like I was able to run the marathon and like crush it. And we're in such a different place, literally a few days later, but it only, instead of me imploding the relationship of the person who was, I put in the wrong C, not them. Uh, like, instead of like blowing everything up, like I've done in the past, I sat and thought about it, made a little tweak and adjustment and it was rocket fuel because I was able to put healthy constraints in place and not rush around like crazy every day. And so that's such an important thing, whatever stage you're at, I really believe and and I know you work heavily in this area. Like, I don't know, it doesn't matter if you haven't made, you know, $50,000 a year yet, or if you hadn't made a million dollars yet, or even two or 3 million, I think the fastest way to get to your next big mark, whatever that is for you is just slow down, pause, reflect, take some time to journal, just slow the fuck down and think about what's going on. And then you can, you can think about it and make the next right move. This is chess. This is not, you know, this is not, you know, I always say entrepreneurship is a marathon. It's not a sprint. So slow down. And that's, it's been, and you have to do that at every level too. So I do want to be clear with everybody. You have to do that. What I just described and what George just shared with us here really clearly in one way, when you're trying to break six figures, and then when you got to break seven figures, you got to learn the whole fucking lesson all over again. <laughs> yep. It's over and over and over. And so it's just always bigger, better problems. And I'm and then, always- and then, and then the same at eight. And then you have to do it to people underneath you and teach them the same lessons and let them grow and learn. And like, bro, I'm telling you, it's, it's so true. And it, it's the infinite race because there's never a finish line to this game, yeah. ever, <laughs> ever, ever a finish line to this game. And I think one thing you just said is slowing down. One of the, no matter what level you're on is you can only win one game at a time, but most entrepreneurs try to play four at a time. And by slowing down, you get to see what field you're on. And there might be a time that you're like, oh, I'm playing basketball. You're like on the football field and you have to play that sport and reflection time. And uh, as Keith Cunningham calls thinking time, if you've never read his book, The Road Less Stupid, it's amazing. It's like a encyclopedia of entrepreneurial lessons from somebody who's done like a billion dollars in revenue. He calls it thinking time and he's like this is the road to being less stupid think about this reflect on this like be with this and and really what it is is making sure like hey am i playing the right sport am i on the right field am i calling the right plays what adjustments do i need to make okay go play again or oh crap i didn't realize i was still playing football i'm supposed to go on the curling ice right now or i'm about to go do bobsledding i don't know pick your analogy right but but that but that time is so imperative because you're a weapon like entrepreneurs are weapons but uh, weapons are ineffective when they don't have a target. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Dangerous. <laughs> the yeah. end. And so most of the time is you end up causing massive amounts of collateral damage when you don't know your target. And um, Gabe and I will say firsthand that we, we've been there and it's like we somehow shoot 360 degrees at all times and everybody gets hurt. And we're like, no, no, no. And they're like, hey, can you put that on a target, please? I'm like, oh yeah, got you. Got you. Like I'll keep it on safe until I'm really clear what the target is and then we all win. Yeah. And it, and it, the other theme of the conversation uh, and we'll, we'll close here is I read something uh, that a good friend of mine, Will Hurst sh- uh, recommended to me recently. It's um, a book called the Cabillion. And if you haven't, if you haven't read it, you'd love it, George, you, you may have already, but there's a, co- a concept in there. They talk about that says um, extremes are one in the same. They're, they're all the same. So we're talking about going slow here 
And I really want everybody to understand that if you slow down, you will go faster than everybody around you. Yep. <laughs> and if you go fast without intention and thinking time, you will be traveling the road most stupid yep. <laughs> and you will crash and burn and you will have nothing and talk about slow and no freedom and no time and all the things that you signed up for. It's so it's just, there's always these balancing, you know, aspects and harmonizing things and getting everything dialed in. But when you truly understand that these two elements on what appear to be this, you know, different ends of the spectrum are not, it's not that, far removed at all they're actually really close and cross over all the time and that's if you want to get really fast just slow down a little bit it'll be so much easier (laughs) i'll tell you right now like temperance is the secret and i i was in the military on active duty for 12 years and i never got it where they're like slow is smooth and smooth is fast and slow is smooth and smooth is fast but then when you see it in real world application it, it really really is powerful because you're intentional and effective at what you do and it's the effectiveness that makes you fast right like sure. so like i'm glad that you can sprint 100 yards when we're running a marathon but like i'm just gonna walk i'm still gonna beat you right <laughs> like i'm still gonna get there before and and it really really is a, a super super valuable lesson that we need to be super intentional like the, the i'll close with this because i think this is really important and i don't talk about this a lot when we think about our lives as humans, as entrepreneurs, there's only two variables that we can control. We can only control our energy and our intention. Everything else is out of our control. And so you can have the best intention in the world, but if you don't put the same amount of energy into it and have a clear place to pour it, nothing comes out of it. You're just pouring water into a leaky bucket and then you're expecting some magic result right? And it's like, oh, I have a sales problem. So I'm going to go on social media more. I'm like, that's not your problem. Like you need to have some time to identify like, what is it? Is it your messaging? Is it your offer? Is it your audience? Is it the consistency? But I will tell you all the time, it's never amplitude. It's never amplitude, right? Because if your offer was that good, you'd have people knocking on your damn door, not you trying to get more people to find it, right? And it's one of those things that when we can really take that step back and look at, wow, if there's only two inputs I control, which my intention and my energy, and you're like, okay, cool. I want to get to six figures a month. And I'm like, awesome. And I was like, what's your intention on a scale of one to 10? And you're like a nine. I'm like, cool. Honestly, looking at your day, what's your energy into getting a hundred grand a month? And they're like, um, what do you mean? I'm like, if you have eight hours of work a day of those eight hours, how many of those hours are you spent only pulling the levers or needle movers that will get you to a hundred grand a month? And they're like, like an hour. I was like, so what would you grade that on a scale of one to 10? And they're like a two. And I was like, so let me get clear. You're pissed off that you don't have a hundred thousand dollars a month, but yet you're only giving 20% of your effort to generate it and expecting a hundred percent return. (laughs) And they're like, Oh, and I was like, yeah, this hurts. I do this to myself all the time. I'm like, why doesn't my podcast have 86 million downloads? I'm like, because I haven't worked to get 86 million downloads because I've been living in the field of dreams mentality because I'm tired. (laughs) <laughs> so if I build it, they might come, even though I know they won't, but it's time to shift focus. But once you start to play that game, it's really, really simple because you're like, oh, this is the result that I was trying to create. This was my intention and this was my energy. And you're like, oh, well, of course I didn't get it. But then you have a very clear picture of what the target is. Like if you want more, you have to give more. Yeah. If you want more, you have to be clear on what you're giving. And so those two variables are really my biggest metrics for entrepreneurs. Like I just had my entire mastermind do this exercise. And a lot of them ended up like 20 or 30% increasing their business in a week by simply putting a measure on where they were spending their time and realizing that they were spending their time doing things that weren't going to create a result. And the moment they aligned and they put the energy where they wanted it, everything was magic. Right. And I'm like, Oh yeah, it's probably a copy problem. Right. (laughs) Or a marketing problem. (laughs) <laughs> love it oh, yeah so i'll leave I'll, I'll end with that one because we're gonna have to do like round 74 of this we are definitely gonna do that so thank you so much for coming on george where where would you like people to connect with you oh yeah the easiest place is mindofgeorge.com it belongs in a straight jacket so only if it's your level of crazy and you want to be in my padded room 
Uh, it's just mindofgeorge.com because then you can pick your poison. Uh, if you like the podcast, it's linked there. If you want to join our Facebook group, the Relationships Feed Algorithms, it's linked there. If you're going to come to our event in April, it's linked there. If you are like, this dude is nuts and you just want to leave, I will find you. But thanks for the touch point and hopefully it moved you in a direction closer to your goals. Thank you so much, George. We'll definitely have you back soon. Thank you so much for the time. Thanks, man. This show is brought to you by Today's Business Leaders. Learn more at our website, todaysbusinessleaders.com. Be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts or Spotify today.